Our next um, presenter is General Bruce Carlson, U.S. Air Force retired. General Carlson is the 17th director of the National Reconnaissance Office. He took that job up in uh, June of this year. Um, he, is a, he was a command pilot with more than 3,500 flying hours in 10 combat aircraft, in 10 aircraft and saw so combat as a FAC, a forward air controller in the OV-10 Bronco, which older people will remember. Um, prior to um, his retirement, he commanded um, at the Air Force Material Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is a really neat place. Anyway, we're very pleased to have General Carlson with us. Please uh, join me in welcoming General Carlson. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you much. I'm going to get these out of your way. We're doing eight of these. No, that's okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, a delight for me to be out of Washington, D.C., and especially to be in San Antonio, Texas, my home. I, uh, I, was, in, uh, I was in an undisclosed location last week uh, in a vault and gave a briefing on the capabilities of the National Reconnaissance Office. And uh, not because of my personality or the way I present briefings, but simply because of the content of that briefing, um, I got a standing ovation. So I thought, gosh, that's a pretty good briefing, and I, why don't I just present that down at GEOINT? <laughs> and uh, so I sent it in for review, and, and this is what I got back. <laughs> so, uh, Based on that, my, uh, my crack staff came up with uh, 22 pages of uh, remarkable text. And, uh, and I am prepared to read that to you. <laughs> but instead of doing that, maybe what I thought I would do is uh, spend a few minutes talking to you about the National Reconnaissance Office and some of my uh, my perceptions and, uh, and vision for what we're going to do in the future, and, uh, and, and, the, and my hope is that that will answer all the questions um, so that you'll get a 45-minute break instead of a 30-minute break. Um, <clears throat> first question that people um, ask me, uh, one of the first questions people ask me is, uh, given that there's a lot of things wrong at the NRO, um, tell me some of the good things that are going on out there. And, uh, and yes, there are some things wrong, and I'll talk about those. Um, they're, they're no, uh, those are some of the things that are not hidden. And uh, in fact, we get criticized for a number of things, and, and some of them rightfully so. But there are some things that are very right at, the, at your National Reconnaissance Office that I think you ought to know about. And the first one of those is uh, people. Um, as you know, we have a, a workforce that is not our own. Um, I'm not going to fight that battle. Uh, there are some who, who would like to give us another 100 people and call those the NRO workforce. I think that's absurd. And, uh, and if I get them, I will convert them to Air Force or a Navy or agency personnel. Uh, if I got 3,200 people as an NRO workforce, that would be another argument. But that's beside the point. Uh, the people that we have there are are an incredibly dedicated workforce. I've had experience leading large groups of civilians, and they were great people. They did good things. But quite frankly, those groups of civilians that I have led in the past don't compare with the civilian workforce combined with the uh, military expertise that we have out at the National Reconnaissance Office. They are a national treasure. Now, I can't keep them forever. So I'm working hard on a, a pilot program, and that's the only way you can get things moving in a hurry in the, in the bureaucracy today, a pilot program to hire um, college graduates who I will pay for a master's degree as long as they don't get a master's degree in basket weaving or sociology or Minnesota aquatic studies. They have to get a, a technical degree. Um, and agree to come to work for me for about six years. And I'll pay for their tuition and books and give them a little stipend while they're going to school. 
And uh, my hope is to begin to grow some of that uh, talent that we need inside the agency to replace some of those scientists and artists who will age out over time. But my workforce is still the most priceless thing that we have, and they are performing uh, magnificently. The second thing uh, is the technology. Now, there's two edges to this sword. The first edge is that we don't have as much as we'd like. Uh, and I'll talk specifically about that in just a couple of minutes. But uh, uh, nonetheless, the technology that we are pursuing inside the National Reconnaissance Office is absolutely leading edge. We partner with um, the finest universities, the most advanced companies, and other government agencies, some of whom have spoken here uh, uh, this week, to develop that technology. Now, we don't have as much money as we'd like to, to move it forward as fast as we'd like, to field it, to incorporate it into the, some of the systems we are fielding. But nonetheless, the technology is still um, leading the world. And some of you take part in some of that technology. And for that, I am very, very grateful. Uh, the third thing that I think is right with the NRO is our relationship with our partners and customers. Uh, Admiral Bob Moret was just up here a few minutes ago and somebody asked him, I think, something about the relationship with the NRO. And, uh, and I have to say exactly the same thing. Uh, of course, in any large organization, there is friction and conflict. But that's how you make things better. If, if everything was running so smoothly that no one cared if Bob Moret and I that's not for me, I don't think. Um, that no one cared that Bob Moret and I ever left town, I would be very suspicious that we were actually getting anything done. So he and I actually enjoy, as well as Keith Alexander, Ron Burgess, we enjoy a little bit of conflict every now, just every, every now and then, just to make sure that the systems are working together and that we're applying as much pressure from both sides or all four sides uh, as we possibly can. So I think the relationships that we have with our mission partners have never been better. And I have never had the privilege to work with a more superb leadership team than uh, we are fortunate to have uh, in place today. The fourth thing that I think is uh, right with the National Reconnaissance Office is our support to the warfighter. Um, I have been, not to every combatant commander uh, yet, but I have been to, to half of them. And to the man, they are all incredibly complimentary of what the agency, the organization is doing. Now, I have, I have worked very hard to get the right people focused on that business. And I have Dr. Pete Rustan, who does nothing but focus on our relationship with the warfighter and our our interface with users and how we're servicing customers. And, uh, um, and I'm satisfied that we're doing very well. There's always more we can do. In fact, in fact, every trip that Pete goes on, he comes back with a list of things to do. And that's exactly what I would expect. This is a dynamic world, a dramatic war. It's a changing war. We're switching uh, regions with inside the AOR. Uh, there are new intelligence needs, and so we're trying to service those the best we possibly can. We're in over 70 different locations. We've got liaisons and working people uh, inside the AOR uh, servicing the warfighters' needs uh, every day. So those are the things I think are right with the, uh, with the NRO. Uh, now, uh, let me just go uh, transition into a few other things that aren't aren't quite as good as I'd like them to be. But, but before I do that, uh, maybe just spend a minute or two and talk about uh, this uh, thing that we're involved in here. Um, I have to tell you, and you heard my background there a little bit in the introduction two months ago, I'd never heard of GeoInt. Um, and, and I didn't lose sleep over the fact that I, didn't, I hadn't heard of GeoInt. Uh, but I felt guilty about it after I learned. And then after yesterday uh, and the day before, uh, walking the floor, and I think I visited almost every booth, 
Um, there are a few that I missed just because my, this is my second pair of shoes and I wore out the first pair. Um, uh, I am incredibly impressed. I've been to another, a number of other symposiums and, uh, and expositions that are related to this, but I have never seen one that is so focused on the mission and on technical capability. And, uh, and I have learned a great deal. I've met a number of people who I'll get to have an opportunity to do business with over the next few years, I hope. And I have uh, advanced uh, my personal tradecraft uh, exponentially because of my attendance here. So first, my thanks to um, the foundation for the hard work that they do to put something like this together on a consistent basis. My understanding that it's been going on for only a short number of years and that the growth curve has been remarkable and the support uh, by industry has also been remarkable. So second, may I compliment uh, the industrial partners who have done so much uh, in such a dramatic and uh, downturning time to support um, efforts like this so that we can get together and talk about common needs and common uh, solutions. Um, second, uh, I'd like to maybe go into a little bit of the history that leads people to ask me the second question, and that is, what's wrong with the NRO? Well, it's a complex story, but I see by the clock we have 31 minutes and 15 seconds. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the complex story. Um, the charter for the NRO is, uh, was built in 1964. The organizations that signed it no longer exist in the form that they did then. They're still around, they're still doing great things, but they don't exist in the form that they did then. It's time for a new charter, it's outdated. Uh, second, the funding modalities and the um, push for requirements are different than they were 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 years ago. The need for overhead intelligence uh, is significantly different. I didn't say it was invalid. I just said it's different than it was 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Um, the workforce, uh, although composed of the same groups of people, is remarkably different than it was even five years ago. The demands on that workforce and the number of people and the mix of uh, competencies are significantly different. And we're fighting a war and it's been a long war, and the drain on our people and our assets have been remarkable. In addition to that, we, we started a very concerted, a very objective and conscious effort to take money and capacity and capability out of space reconnaissance. And that, that's been done over a decade and a half. So with all that behind us, uh, some things happened inside Washington, D.C. that led to a couple of significant and very, very costly failures in space reconnaissance. Um, I was in Washington then. I was on the joint staff. I was the money guy for the joint staff. So I knew a little bit about that big, those big money decisions that were being made. I gave my input. and. Uh, Whatever happened, happened, and, uh, and we had some failures. Those failures, uh, as I look back at them and as I review the, not the history, but as I review the activities that I was engaged in and the circumstances that surrounded those failures, I note um, professionally that there was a lot of blame to go around. There was blame in the intelligence community. There was blame in the joint staff. There was blame in the Air Force and the other services and the OSD staff. There was blame over in the Congress. But I also have been in Washington long enough to know that that's how, not how the system works. Somebody's got to take the blame. So the National Reconnaissance Office took it on the chin. All right? That's fine. That's the way that's... I'm not going to discuss whether it's fair or not. It doesn't matter. Those are the facts that National Reconnaissance Office 
took that one on the chin. Okay? So we had some failures. That was in the past. If you look at our recent, I'm talking about the last 18 months, performance inside the National Reconnaissance Office, you will see that in terms of cost, schedule, and performance, we are plus or minus 5%, which is remarkable in the kind of business that we're in. We are going to turn the corner, and we are going to, to begin to deliver things on time and on cost. So that gets to my priorities. What are they? I have several of them, but I'll just give you my top four. First, we're going to launch the equipment that we have under construction in the next 15 to 18 months. Now, I went through college and got a business degree, and I didn't do very well in that. That's why I became a fighter pilot, uh, because I realized I couldn't be successful in business. And, uh, and so I'm going to give you my view of the construction and launch of a rocket. It's a little bit like a, a woman giving birth to a child. We know about when it's going to happen, but the precise date is not exactly known. So I'm just telling you, within the next 15 months, that's the gestation period of the rest of these, these pieces of equipment we've got to launch. We're going to launch them. Now, one of them might be set for the 1st of December or the 5th of December, and we might not make it till the 15th. That's not the issue with me. But in the next 15 to 18 months, we are going to launch those vehicles. We're going to put them into orbit in the place they're supposed to be, and they're going to start doing what we have asked them to do. That is my number one priority. They are big payloads. They, do, they will do important and critical national intelligence missions, and we're going to launch them. So don't screw that up and don't get in the way, because that's number one for me. I have got to lead an organization that can demonstrate performance. Second priority is the business of launch. Um, the business of launch in this country is not very good. The state of launch is not very good. Many of you out there who I've talked to have packages already built and ready to go and sitting in a barn someplace waiting a rocket. That's a dickens of a way to have a space program. You'd think, on the other hand, uh, unlike you'd, if you were in the Hertz rent-a-car business, you wouldn't want people standing in line waiting for cars. Uh, the Hertz rent-a-car business wouldn't be a Hertz rent-a-car if there were 50 people standing in line at every counter because there were no cars available. We've simply got to turn that around. Again, it was a host of, of conscious decisions made over time that got us into the position where we are today, where we essentially have one launch crew, one set of launch equipment, two places to launch from. They're spread out across the continent, and, uh, and we've forgotten how to build the equipment that gets space vehicles into orbit. And we're reconstituting that and through the superhuman efforts of some very, very dedicated people, but it's just going to take some time. So that's my second priority. The third uh, priority is our S&T budget, and I told you that the technology is great, and it is. In fact, we have just launched some technology that, has been, that, that will demonstrate over the next decade or so just how absolutely leading edge uh, the NRO is. However, if you look at my S&T budget, of the budget of the uh, National Reconnaissance Office, what you'll see is a budget that has been slashed by 50% in the last five years. That is the seed corn for the future. That is what keeps young, energetic, hardworking engineers and scientists excited, motivated, and eager to come to work every day, is to be able to work on the kind of technology that is going to launch four, five, or ten years from now. And we're not doing nearly enough of it. Shame on us. Shame on this nation for forfeiting its future like we're doing in S&T. And I have a little bit of experience in this business. I spent almost four years in the Air Force doing 
uh, its science and technology, and it's practically the same way there. So we're not alone. S&T budgets have been slashed in, in all of our agencies. And so we are working very, very hard to make sure that between us and DARPA, us and IARPA, us and AFRL and so on, that there's not any duplication, that we're working synergistically together. We have to do that in order to maximize the utility of each of these dollars. But we're not doing as well as we should. My uh, fourth priority is uh, our people. And I, they're not in new order, but these, this is my, uh, one of the ones that keeps me up at night. I told you that our people are the greatest, and, and I, I, uh, I won't change that mind. I will just tell you that because personnel systems have changed over time, the requirement, for instance, to get promoted if you're a young uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Acquisition Officer, um, those requirements are so much different than they were uh, just a few years ago that I have difficulty uh, retaining uh, these people for more than about two years at a time. And if you're, <clears throat> you're trying to build a spacecraft uh, that takes six or eight or ten years to build, and you have to have three or four different program managers during that time period, uh, it's not very good for program management. And it's the same way with the other portion of our workforce. They're required joint tours, schooling, um, career broadening, and a whole bunch of other things that a few years ago were just not in the requirement set. So that's, uh, that's my uh, next priority. Uh, let me just mention a minute um, a bit about the uh, partnerships we have with um, our, our uh, mission partners. I think they're very good, and, and I think uh, Admiral Moret mentioned that, so I won't go any further. Uh, let me just conclude my uh, unprepared remarks by, um, by saying a, a couple more things. First, uh, a charter. Uh, I've talked, told you that it's an old, we are in the middle of reworking a charter. That has been tried probably a half a dozen times over the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Uh, we now have a process that has been agreed to by the Secretary of Defense and the uh, Director of National Intelligence. That process will take us probably 60, 70 days. I wanted to do it a lot faster than that, uh, but uh, uh, we're going to take the 60 or 70 days and, and work our way through it. Uh, it'll probably be about two uh, pages long. Uh, we have written the organizing principles for that charter, and it addresses thing, such things as uh, the, uh, an XCOM being formed uh, where we can make uh, the kind of decisions we need to make about important national overhead systems. It addresses the uh, MDA authority for the reconnaissance office. It addresses uh, control of our personnel. Now, it's not all perfect. It's not exactly what I wanted, but that's not the point. We're going to have a charter. It will address um, the requirements process and, uh, and the director of the NRO having some input into the requirements process. Now, before the pens start flashing and people start making phone calls, let me tell you what I mean by that. I don't mean changing requirements. What I do mean is that in the past, and I know just a little bit about this because I was the director of requirements for the Air Force and the director of requirements for the Joint Staff, so I know a little bit about how it works. In the past, the requirements process has forced us, forced us in the development and acquisition business to commit to things that were pricey, took a long time, and were very difficult. Now, for those of you who are in program management, you know you really only have three variables, cost, schedule, and management. Well, if you're dealing with something that's pricey, if it takes a long time and it's highly risky to do, the management capacity of a program manager gets to be very limited. So at some point during the requirements process, somebody has to stand up and say, as the developer, we don't think we can do that. Or if, if you really want to do that, you better give us another 10 months or 30 months, or, or you better give us a lot more money. Now, is it really worth that to you to have a two-speed cigarette lighter and a fur -line glove box? Is that what you really want out of this thing? And, and so it's not saying no 
It's just advising the requirements process of the cost schedule and performance impacts that some of these things have. Because sometimes we get requirements um, that are incredibly difficult to satisfy within the cost schedule and performance parameters that we've been issued. So that's the charter. Finally, I'd like to uh, close with just a minute or so on NGO. And uh, um, there's been a, a great uh, de deal of debate in our little tiny community. It's sort of a tempest in a teapot, I know, and, and it doesn't affect everybody. But uh, in, a, in what I thought was a remarkable uh, feat of uh, bureaucratic cooperation, the Director of National Intelligence, the Secretary of Defense, took a proposal for a next generation uh, EO architecture to the President. And the President said, I agree. And the Department of Defense and the intelligence community had agreed already, so we began to march forward. And you'd think that uh, with that kind of horsepower that this would be a pretty simple uh, feat. Not so fast, Buffalo Breath. There are, there are some who believe that there are other solutions to this problem. Now let me just say that from a, a technical and a requirements, performance perspectives, there are other opportunities to pursue, but they simply do not fulfill the requirement. And this NGO concept that we have in mind will require a little bit of upfront investment, but over time it will develop a family of vehicles that will be much less costly to acquire, will be much more easily modified, have a much more open architecture, be more modularly constructed, and allow us the ability to insert new technology faster than we have ever been able to do before. And all of the other candidates will certainly feed technology into that future. And they're important that we do, but they are not solutions to this incredibly complex and difficult intelligence collection requirement on behalf of the warfighter, the intelligence community, and the national security apparatus. So I stand firm on NGO and um, anxious to work the associated technologies that come along uh, as they're appropriate. But our next generation uh, overhead intelligence architecture will be head and led by uh, NGO. So with that, let me stop and uh, allow for a few minutes of uh, questions. And I've brought along a, a third of the NRO over here to answer them if, uh, if you've got any hard ones. So, Mark. General, thank you for your candid remarks. You bet. Um, and I know you have to leave here on time, or we will get you off stage okay. on time. Okay, all right. Um, I'm just going to put my stuff together in case okay, hard, there are any hard questions I can just retreat. Yes, all right. Here, this, well, right. Listen, you, I saw you last week get asked the strangest question I, I've ever oh. seen in 35 years. It was another conference in his building, and the first question was, do you want to buy a company? And everyone said, what the heck? Anyway, um, I'm not going to ask you that one again. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> What's the one thing that keeps you awake at night? Uh, the next 15 months. The last 15 months. The next 15 next, months. Next 15 months. Well, that's uh, a good I'll answer. I'll explain that. Um, when it comes to launch, does NRO expect NASA to be part of the solution to the gap? And if not, what is NASA's role? Uh, you bet. Um, and we work very closely with NASA. We'll have, uh, in fact, we just concluded a, a large launch symposium uh, out at, uh, I can't remember whether it was at Colorado or Vandenberg. We sent a team of people out there. Um, and it, it has to be a multi-community, uh, Air Force, um, other agencies, NASA and the uh, NRO have to be involved in this because, as I said, we have such limited capacity. So uh, there are some of us, and I include all of us out there, who aren't going to be happy with the solutions uh, because it's going to mean the package that you've got ready to go is going to sit in the barn a little longer. Um, and, uh, and we have um, some priorities, the Air Force has priorities, NASA has priorities. We will do our best together uh, with the Air Force in the lead 
to make sure that we, we optimize the, useful, the use of those facilities, the equipment, uh, and the people. Hey, this is a very good question. We've heard many statements this week about the need to change and adapt within the time cycle of the enemy. How can this be accomplished with a next generation system that takes 10 years to deploy? Um, okay, I'll answer that, but can I, can I ask you to, uh, would you put that question on hold? Because I think Pete Rustan is going to talk. Okay, Aren't Pete, you Pete? You're out. Aren't you going to talk today? All okay, right, Pete, but, that but one's let's, yours. let's put that one on Pete's. Okay. Uh, but let me just say. Uh, <laughs> and that's why he's the director. <laughs> because Pete will give you a great answer because he, he did that and did remarkably well at that um, uh, for the last few months. But let me just say, uh, we do a lot of that through the incredible creative um, use of our ground systems. And let me just give you a sort of a generic example. I apologize that I can't get into the specifics, but we got a satellite up there that is um, 10 times older than we expected it to be. Okay, we expected it to be this up there this long, it's been up there this long, and it's still working. We expected it to do a mission, uh, let's see, I have to be, we expected it to do a mission that had to do with uh, strategic long haul communications. And today, it's helping us kill bad guys in the AOR. Mm -hmm. Now that's as specific as I can get, but we do that because of the incredible contractor and NRO team that we have that nurses that satellite along and the young people that write software to change its functionality and keep it going. That's so, that's... yeah, I know it takes a long time, but the systems that, that we have on orbit, I think that are, the public gets for a real mm -hmm. bargain because the constellation is this big, half of it is uh, uh, geriatric, and yet uh, it's all functioning. Mm -hmm. You talked about your concerns about S&T funding. Um, what are your plans in terms of that part of your budget to improve that? Beg. <laughs> um, we, in Be fact, begging is good. We will go, um, uh, Bob and I, Admiral Moret and I were just talking in the back uh, before we came on, there'll be a, an, an XCOM. That's where the, the Director of National Intelligence gets together with all of his senior staff next Monday, I think, where we'll, we will talk specifically about the budget and I already have my talking points prepared for our S&T budget. I don't know what'll happen. Uh, the pressure on the budget in FY11 is, is as difficult and tough as I've ever seen it, and, uh, and we'll just have to see how it turns out. The last question, and it's a big question. Um, you're an expert acquisition professional. <laughs> right. Congratulations. Does the current system of multiple checks and balances really help ensure mission success and capability delivery to the operators, what changes would you recommend? Well, I can only change what, I, what is under my uh, authority. And I have, uh, I have tweaked just a little bit the organization that Scott Large began to put in place. Uh, and I, the only thing I've done is take out a layer in the middle to get the program managers closer to me. Um, you know, if I was in the Air Force, the law in the Air Force was, and it wasn't the Air Force law, it was public law, you can only have one person between the program manager and the PEO. Well, we had too many layers, and so we have, we have streamlined that a little bit. Um, I, quite frankly, am not worried about the rest of it. My view is that if you perform, if you do what you contract for, if you meet the requirement, if you deliver on cost and you deliver on time, I don't care how picky I don't care how nosy and how much minutia they want to get into, they can come and look anytime they want. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to do in the National Reconnaissance Office. General, thank you very much. It's a I know you got to get Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. All right, Mark, great. great to see you. Thank you very much.